nuisance or nuance. Uh, most gastroduodenal polyps are indeed a nuisance. I'm going to highlight some of the uh, nuances. So what's a nuisance polyp? Well, it's really an annoyance. It's an incidental finding when we do uh, upper endoscopy. The polyp is not symptomatic. It has no malignant potential. It's benign. Therefore, there's no role for EUS. Resection is not indicated. And even a biopsy may be optional, depending on your confidence in the endoscopic diagnosis. A nuanced polyp may be symptomatic. It may have malignant potential. And depending on your concern for that, you may see a role for EUS. Resection is always indicated. And you may want to biopsy the normal appearing non polypoid mucosa. So let's start with fundic gland polyps. These are the most common polyps we see in the West, three quarters of all polyps, one out of four endoscopies. They are associated with long term PPI therapy, and therefore their incidence is increasing. These are almost always nuisance polyps. They're small, they're in the proximal stomach, they have a typical appearance this smooth, shiny, glassy surface. But rarely, they may be a nuanced polyp if associated with a polyposis syndrome like FAP or Gardner syndrome. You may see numerous carpet-like polyps. They may be large. They may be ulcerated. They may be located in the antrum. There may be a concurrent duodenal adenoma. And in any younger patient, who is not on PPIs, you need to think of the possibility of a syndromic fundic gland polyp. A biopsy of a sporadic fundic gland polyp is really optional. This is a prospective study. They looked at typical endoscopic features for sporadic FGPs, and they found that these features had a very high positive pred predictive value of almost 90%. And in fact, of those biopsies that were not fundic gland polyps, none of them showed dysplasia, and three of them were actually normal. So what does our society tell us? Quote, sporadic fundic gland polyps may develop in association with long-term PPI use and are not associated with an increased risk of cancer. Of course, in the absence of FAP. We suggest polypectomy of fundic gland polyps one centimeter or larger though I might almost argue that we may not need to treat any of uh, sporadic fundic gland polyps. Hyperplastic polyps. These are the second most common polyp in the West. They are more common in non-Western countries because of the increased pre prevalence of H. pylori. They have characteristic pools of mucinous exudate on the surface, hence they're sometimes called inflammatory polyps. But these do have a risk of dysplasia and focal cancer in up to 19%. These are nuisance polyps when they are less than 5 millimeters. And these will almost always regress with H. pylori eradication. They become nuanced polyps when they are large or pedunculated or cause symptoms such as bleeding or obstruction. But it's not just about the polyp. It's about the neighboring mucosa. The hyperplastic polyp is a marker for the precancerous pre -cancerous condition of the gastric mucosa. Gastric cancer was found in the neighboring mucosa in 8.5% of patients. There is associated chronic gastritis in 89%, mostly autoimmune, but also H. pylori corpus dominant type. So systematic biopsies from the antrum and the corpus Lesser and greater curvature, and maybe even the angularis, should be considered. If you find a hyperplastic polyp, treat first for H. pylori, if H. pylori is positive. In this study, 80%, this is a randomized control trial, 80% regressed after HB eradication. And none of the patients that were not treated for H. pylori uh, had disappearance of their polyps. If the polyp persists, despite H. pylori eradication, should you biopsy or should you resect? This study showed us, comparing biopsy and polypectomy results, that among 222 patients, five of the six discrepancies 
were in patients with hyperplastic polyps on their biopsy. On the polypectomy specimens, three had foci of adenocarcinoma. And in two cases, it was a completely different diagnosis. It was tubular adenoma and a carcinoid tumor. So you must resect these polyps. Hyperplastic polyps are hypervascular. These patients often bleed after resection. So consider ligation, whether you use band or loop or clips after resection. This is one example of what I do in my practice. You can see it's a pedunculated polyp. I'll use the snare to snip off just the tip of this pedunculated polyp. As soon as we resect, you'll see that it starts to bleed in the characteristic fashion that we expect from a hyperplastic polyp. So that's why we're going to do a ligation now, a band ligation. So we're sucking the stump into the cap, we deploy our band, and then you'll see how that stump turns uh, pale. And so this patient won't have any post-resection bleeding. Large hyperplastic polyps should be removed by EMR technique in their entirety. And afterwards, you should close the defect with clips. And this one showed low-grade dysplasia uh, against the background of hyperplastic polyp. So our society tells us that we suggest polypectomy of hyperplastic polyps five millimeters or larger, and we suggest systemic sampling of the surrounding non-polypoid gastric mucosa to assess for H. pylori and metaplastic atrophic gastritis. Very important. Brunner's gland polyps. We see these a lot. They're usually in the bulb, sometimes in the second portion. They arise from the deep mucosa, which is why the biopsies usually are positive, but the mucosa may appear relatively normal. They have virtually no malignant potential. So these are really, for the most part, nuisance polyps. But they become nuanced polyps when they get large and they start to get pedunculated, and they may be symptomatic with bleeding and obstruction. Now, these large Brunner gland polyps may look like submucosal tumors or subepithelial lesions. And that's where EOS can be helpful. And EOS will show these characteristic anechoic areas, these, these uh, cystic areas that are retention cysts from the Brunner glands and the ducts. And this is practically pathognomonic for a Brunner gland polyp. So this is where EOS can be useful. Ectopic pancreas. Well, rarely you might get pancreatitis associated with this, and there have been some case reports of pancreatic cancer developing. But for the most part, this is a nuisance. The typical appearance, central umbilication along the greater curve of the antrum. We've all seen these. You can leave these alone. They become nuanced polyps when they're atypical. There's no umbilication, or they're not located in the antrum. We have to consider other subepithelial lesions. And when they become symptomatic, they can cause bleeding, obstruction, and even pain. Our society states a firm subepithelial lesion with central umbilication along the greater curve of the distal stomach is considered diagnostic for a pancreatic rest, and therefore EUS is not indicated or not required. That means we need do nothing further. Gastric uh, neuroendocrine tumors, formerly called carcinoids, their incidence is increasing tenfold over the past 30 years. These originate from the mucosa and they progressively infiltrate deeper. They are often nuisance polyps, type 1 in 80%. They're associated with autoimmune atrophic gastritis. The gastrin level is elevated. They're multifocal, small, well differentiated on pathology, low proliferation index. And if you did an EUS, it would be very superficial, T1 mucosa. Importantly, though, the 5 and 10 year survival of these patients is the same. It doesn't matter whether you resect these or not. They become nuanced polyps if they're type 3 or 4. These are sporadic, solitary, have a normal gastrin level, and the risk of lymph node metastases increases if they're larger or they're poorly differentiated on pathology, high proliferation index, or if you do EUS and they appear deeply invasive. Our society recommends, we suggest endoscopic resection of small, less than one centimeter type one and type two gastric carcinoids, those are rare, zolling or Ellison associated, that do not demonstrate aggressive features. We suggest endoscopic removal for type three and four gastric carcinoids if they're less than one centimeter in size, so small and isolated. And I would probably add to that that they're well differentiated and have a low proliferation index. And we recommend EUS for local staging of gastric carcinoids if they're type 3 or 4. Gastric adenomas, 
all of these should be endoscopically resected by EMR or ESD. They arise from precancerous gastric mucosa, intestinal metaplasia or atrophic gastritis. So systematic biopsies of the antrum and corpus, lesser and greater curvature, and angularis is indicated. Now endoscopic resection in the duodenum is very different from the stomach. There's much higher risk when you're in the duodenum with unique challenges. This is, the duodenum is thin-walled, has a rich, rich vascular su supply, the lumen is obviously more narrow, and these lesions are bathed in bile and pancreatic juice, which increases the risks during and after resection. The Japanese do not even recommend ESD in the duodenum because the risk of perforation is so high. So this is a duodenal adenoma. Two centimeters, Paris type 2C, you can see it's a little bit of depression uh, here, and it's located on a fold, straddling a fold. So I'm going to show you uh, my preferred technique, the underwater EMR uh, uh, method. And it, using this method, I'm able uh, to optimize the uh, thickness of the duodenal wall because it's already very, very thin. I don't want to thin it further out with gas insufflation. I'm going to use this 25 millimeter ductbill snare now and I'm going to push the snare down. As you note, I did not do a submucosal injection because it's going to go, go straight to the resection. I allow that polyp to float up into the open uh, a snare. So I'm using the floating effect of water submersion. And immediately after the resection, I capture the lesion. It sort of floats in the water, so it doesn't immediately go downstream. And then I close the defect, if I can, with clips, as you saw here. And this is the uh, five-month uh, follow-up uh, view. And we always biopsy the scar afterwards. So here are my practice pearls. Size does matter for gastroduodenal polyps. So if you look at the society guidelines, they recommend that we resect all polyps greater than one centimeter. The only issue I have with that would be I'm not sure fundic gland polyps, sporadic ones, really need to be resected at all. For polyps that are less than one centimeter, we resect these if suspicious for adenoma. And per the ASG guidelines, neuroendocrine tumors less than one centimeter and hyperplastic polyps larger than five millimeters. For hyperplastic polyps, always eradicate H. pylori first if it's positive. And then reassess. It may be gone. No gastric adenoma or hyperplastic polyp is an island unto itself. Remember that. Systematic biopsy of non-polypoid mucosa is, in my opinion, mandatory. So don't forget, it's not just about the polyp, it's also about the surrounding mucosa from which that polyp arose. And, a, and exercise caution when resecting duodenal polyps. These are uniquely challenging with a much higher risk with resection. Thank you very much.